are part of family trinity. We are royalty. We're co-heirs with Christ. We are seated in heavenly places. We are being known from before we were born, before we were even thought about by our, before our parents were even here. We were planned. We were loved. We were cherished by the creator of the universe. We were made for his pleasure. We were made for intimacy. We've got a destiny. We were created for good works that he prepared for us in advance, for his workmanship, we're all equal, he adores us, and on and on and on and on the list goes. And it is absolutely mind-blowingly incredible. And so this week, um, I just want to encourage you, because um, there's a few things happened to me this week, but um, it's really helpful to just have like a, take a notice of things about yourself that are different. Um, so I was in Germany this week uh, with work, and um, I was in a meeting all day with my boss's boss and my boss's boss's boss. So, you know, quite senior. And what I realized, um, helpfully, about myself is that actually, what I know to be true was really was true, is that I don't change who I am for anyone. I am who I am. And whether that that's, means that when I'm in the gym, when I'm at work, when I'm with all these big high dudes in the company, whether I'm at church, actually who I am is who I am because I am solidly secure. My foundation is, I'm cemented into um, Jesus and I know who I am. And so that means that I don't change my spots. I don't um, put on a mask. I don't try and be something I'm not. Um, and so I am... Um, that was one thing I was like, ah, oh, that's good. I'm just being me here. Uh, you know, some of things provoking them a little bit and asking questions like, why are you using that word? What, what, help me understand what, what your thoughts were when you decided to do that. Um, anyway, on my return flight, uh, it was delayed. And actually, I was sitting on the plane. I had texted a few friends being like, hey, you want to join me and declare and this thing speeds up so I don't miss my connection? And, um, but I just sat there and was like, wow, I am completely at peace. And I was literally like, well, God, actually, you're good. And whatever, you, whatever happens is all going to be fine. And you've obviously got things in mind. If you want me to hang out in London for a night, then that'll be fine. So I did sprint off the plane like a crazy person. Very funny. Afterwards, I laughed at myself. As I, I would have loved to have been the security guys watching the CCTV because that was pretty epic. Uh, <laughs> in like a suit with my Converse trainers. I changed them on the plane, ready to go. Uh, but I, I didn't manage. So um, I check into my hotel and uh, I'm like, oh, right, who, who is it going to be? Like, who's God got a set up for like, who, who am I set up to meet? No people really to talk to. I was like, ah, oh, nobody in the lift. I'm like, oh, okay, it's obviously not happening tonight. It must be tomorrow. Off I go. Not really anybody I could chat to on the train. And then I get onto my flight. And, it, well, I'm tired. So I literally just, like, conk out because I was on an early flight. And, um, and then I start to emerge from my slumber. And uh, Holy Spirit just starts to download some things to me about the woman next to me and gave me a word of knowledge, a name. And uh, I was just like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll get back to that. I'm just really tired. I was going to go back to sleep. And Holy Spirit was like, wake up, Jan, and be who you are. I was like, okay then. Okay, I better do that. So I made myself wake up. So I thought, well, I'm going to be who I am. And um, so I chat to this lady. And hilariously, I mean, she, um, she worked for like Morgan Stanley. And she, we were seated on row 21, which only had two seats. Like there was not a third seat. It was just like a big gap in the floor. And um, she tried to sit somewhere else in the plane because she doesn't like flying. So she's tried to get up the front and there were no seats. So she had to sit there. And I shouldn't even have been on that plane because they'd booked me on the red eye and I changed it. So I, and I obviously should have been home the night before. And so I was like, I just explained to her about what God had told me. Well, I had to chat with her first. She don't want to build a bridge. And uh, so I explained to her like what God said to me. And she just burst into tears, just cries, and was just like, I have never met anyone who hears from God before. And I was like, oh well, there are a lot of us out there. Sorry that you've not you know, had this experience before. And she just went, like, how did that start? Like, what do you mean you, he you hear from him? Like, and I just was able to explain to her. She was a, an Italian Catholic, 
And I was able to explain to her actually what, it, what I believe it means to have a relationship with Jesus and to have Holy Spirit come and live inside of you and how we can uh, have a relationship with God. And so I got to pray for her. Uh, her shoulder had been dislocated many times. She let me pray for her. And she was literally like, this is amazing. This is the best thing that's happened to me since I can remember and proceeds to introduce me to her work colleague as we were getting off the plane and it's like became my instant best friend. So, but it was just a real reminder. I tell you that story because actually God knows every single one of us and actually what he wants, he needs for us to get to grips and line up with who we really are because it, until we do, like he can't, you're not going to be the ones who are having these divine appointments with his precious kids who need to taste and see that he's good because I, I needed to, you know, get out of my tiredness and be who I am, which is someone who can release truth and destiny into this woman's life who doesn't really, doesn't know anything about God. And the word of knowledge was like some place that her husband had been born or something. And she just got messed up by God um, and was just undone by his love and his affection. And actually that is what God wants. He wants us to um, actually have yielded surrendered lives and be the one who's willing to um, be used by him and go after his kids. And um, so what I want to do today is just remind you um, of a few specific truths about your identity and then we're going to look at how that relates to honour. So for many of you this will not be, if you've been around hope for a long time, this will not be new information. Uh, but I just really want to encourage you that actually since the last time you heard I preach on identity, you've been transformed from one degree of glory to another, meaning that actually you can be freshly impacted and hear something differently because you're not where you were. Um, so, we're gonna, are you ready? I've got, I'm so excited about this. Um, so, Romans uh, 3.23 says that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we also read in the mirror word that mankind was reduced to an inferior identity through sin. So actually, it doesn't talk, Bible doesn't tell us, like, that it doesn't matter how sinful we were, because our sinful nature was destroyed um, in Jesus' broken body on the cross. The cross restores us to our original identity and design, and it actually just recovers what was already in us. I'll, I'll unpack that more in a moment. So when we were born again, like we were born again when Jesus um, was raised from the dead. 1 Peter 1, 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant and boundless mercy has caused us to be born again, that is, to be reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, and set apart for his purpose to an ever-living hope and confident assurance through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then Romans 6, 3, through his death, the power of your sinful nature was shattered. And then verse 4, we by our baptism were buried with him in death in order that just as Christ was raised from among the dead by the Father's glorious power, we also should live an entirely new life. And then verse 6, could it be any clearer that our former identity is now and forever deprived of its power? For we were co-crucified with him to dismantle the stronghold of sin within us so that we would not continue to live one moment longer submitted to sin's power. So the word co, um, like the, the suffix or prefix, prefix even, uh, is jointly or to the same degree. So actually through baptism, I was co-crucified, co-buried, and raised to a completely new life in Jesus, um, which means that actually, like, I, it messes with my head to think this through, but which really what that means is that I was united with Jesus when he was hanging on a tree, uh, which took place before I was even born on the earth, and that actually what died was my sinful, like, fleshly nature, but that God didn't just pull, he didn't just pull me out of sin, he pulled, um, he didn't just pull me out of sin, he pulled sin out of me. And so actually the old me is dead um, and buried and actually doesn't exist any longer because I am now this new person because I came to life after baptism, up I come from the water and I am this brand new person who's been born from above. And, and so the thing, I used to get into all sorts of messes in my younger days of actually like, you know, sin, repent, sin, repent, sin, repent. 
But actually, the thing is that Christian growth is not a process of rooting out sin in our life. It's actually of discovering Christ in us, the hope of glory. Because when we discover who we're joined to, who, we are in, who we're in union with, who we're a part of, and who, I mean, Jesus... The thing was that he didn't just want us to have a relationship like he has with Father. He wants us to be in his relationship with the Father. And so it's actually this thing of understanding when you, when you understand who you are, like sin is just not even in your head or, or in your body or anywhere near you because you're just so consumed by him that you're like, wow, Jesus is king. And actually that is the place that he wants us to live in is that we're so like undone by him and so overwhelmed by who we are in him and who like like the amazing person that he's made us to be actually that like yes okay we can get angry or whatever but we're not like in this weird sin repent sin repent cycle um 2 corinthians 5 uh, 16 says from now on therefore we regard no one according to the flesh and verse 17 therefore if anyone is in christ he is a new creation the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So in Greek, you probably know this, but there are a few terms for new. One is neos, which is new in relation to time. So um, I had an old pair of Converse trainers and um, I got, uh, they wore out. And so I bought a new pair, a new neos pair of Converse. That would be the example. Um, and then the other um, term is a kinos, which is new in quality, which actually really means unique or novel, um, something never seen before, um, unusual or innovative. So actually we are not um, a new model of the same pair of converse or an upgraded version, um, if you stay with that analogy, but actually we are something altogether different than before. Jesus actually transformed the very substance of who I am. Like, I am a kinos creation, which means that, um, actually, I haven't even begun to scratch the surface of what that really means. So, stick with the trainer analogy. So, I, I don't have a pair of new Converse trainers on. What I have are, like, supernatural shoes or, like, somewhat, like, souped-up version, which they can, like, let me be transported from one place to another. I can walk through walls, levitate, walk on water, turn invisible. Like, there are just so, like, I'm a new breed. I'm this new person. And that Jesus' death was like this supernatural transaction where basically my entire, like, core substance was completely altered. And so I am this, like, I'm not this, I'm not the same person. Like, Jan, that, anyone who knows me when I was a kid to Jan, who I am now, it's like, I am the same person. Like, I am a new a new person, like I, this incredibly glorious version. Um, and so when, when you get born again, you come up out of the waters of baptism, you're, you're changed from one substance to another. And although like we have, still have a human body, everybody here's got flesh, we are not actually um, merely human anymore because we are a new creation. So whether you feel it or not, you're actually one body and one spirit with Jesus. Um, and the, the Greek word for um, creation, um, I, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, but it's like K-T-I-S-I-S. -I -I and it basically means properly or a creation or creature which is founded from nothing. So a paraphrase of this verse could be that if, if anyone is in Christ, they are an innovative creature formed by God in the same way that he created the planets from nothing but his word and his breath. We've got a new nature which is formed purely of God's substance, nothing of earth, the true you designed in eternity by God. And so we really need to understand that we are not this person who gets caught up in sin and get, does stupid things and has, you know, let, yes, our behaviors are adjusting, but actually we have to get to grips with who we really are, which is this, like, if we, I think it was at um, C.S. Lewis that had this quote that said, if, if we actually could really see each other um, as we are, we would, we would almost want to bow down and worship each other because we are so glorious, so magnificent, so huge. Like, 
I am this height in the natural, but I'm a huge person. See in the spirit, I'm really big, but you don't see what that looks like. But actually, we are all these absolutely incredibly glorious, beautiful, wonderful, um, in Christ Jesus, seated at the right hand of the Father. Actually, that I think I've said this before here many times, that God spoke to me one time and he said, Jan, when I look at you, I can't tell where you end and where Jesus begins, that we are like conjoined twins. Actually, we're so wrapped up in him. Um, and like at, in one, uh, at the beginning of John, it said that um, the word um, was with God. Um, and actually that, that when you unpack it, it's like Jesus at the beginning, who is the word, actually the word was face to face with God is really what it's saying there. And actually Jesus has always been face to face with God. And actually we are caught up and brought into that intimate relationship um, where we're face to face with God because we're in Jesus, um, which is absolutely amazing. And so our identity is really important that we grasp it. However, we all know this, that the enemy is the thing that he always attacks. So we see that with Jesus. He um, has his baptism. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And um, I love that because in Jewish tradition, a father would take their son to like a public place, the gates or the market, and actually declare to everyone, this is my son, and um, would let that be known. And what that was really meaning was he can transact a business on my behalf. He has my authority. He has my approval. Now, if you're going to deal with him, it's as though you were dealing with me. And so Father God does the same thing, but uh, over Jesus. Love that. So, so beautiful. Um, and so you know, we know Jesus goes into the desert after that. And we all know it really well, because we talk about this a lot here, is that um, Satan comes and says, you know, if you are the son of God, says that twice to him and actually tries to really derail him and plant a doubt in his head about what God has just said. And that is exactly what happens to us. So Jesus, he speaks out the truth about, you know, what God really says, he uses uh, the Bible and or the Torah at that time, the word of God um, to silence him. But it's the same for us. We need to hear our father declare our identity. We absolutely need to hear him say who we are um, because the enemy will feed us lies about anything and everything. How we look, uh, what people think about us, our abilities, our significance, um, how well we're following Jesus, uh, on and on and on. Like, oh, nobody knows that about your life and what would they think of you of this and on and on and on, all this nonsense. Um, but actually... I've got a few questions I'm going to bring up. First one is this. Has the, tr has the truth you know in your head about who you really are impacted and taken root in your heart? Because that is the thing. Like, we can know all this stuff. Oh, yeah, Jesus loves me. Oh, yeah, I'm in the Father. I'm seated at the right hand of God because I'm in Christ Jesus. I'm a new creation. I don't, you know, I was born again. I don't have an issue with sin because I'm a new person because I'm, you know, and we can have all this here, but do we have it? Do we really know it, know it, know it deep inside of us? And so how do you fare when the enemy attacks your identity? Like when that, when that barrage of lies and the onslaught comes, actually, can you stand and can you use truth like Jesus did to just be like, eh, yeah, no, ha, <laughs> eh, no. Um, I, and so um, I just want to encourage you to just really, if that isn't, if it's here and not here, like ask God, like, what do you need me to, how do you, what, are there any lies I'm believing? How do you need me to partner with what you want to do in revealing truth to me so that that lands here? Um, Holy Spirit always has answers. Um, so we are incredibly great. 1 John 3, 1 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. And then 1 John 4, 17, As he is, so also are we in this world. Notice it doesn't say as he was, as he is, uh, means glorified, resurrected, seated at the right hand of the Father, Jesus. Um, and so in Luke 9, uh, the disciples have the greatness uh, argument, which I think is just absolute banter. Um, and uh, <laughs> Jesus is amazing how he deals with the disciples. Always love just watching the interaction. You could just picture yourself in the moment and think, oh my goodness, these like... I imagine them to be quite big, burly men. 
because there were fishermen, you know, and all the fishermen I know are big and burly. And I, I just think it would have been hilarious to be part of all those chats. So I picture myself in the scene. But so they're having this, like, oh, I'm amazing. I'm better than you. No, I'm better than you. Or imagine it how you will. And Jesus <laughs> says to them, he who is least among you um, all is the one who is great. And he brings a wee kid over uh, to stand beside him to basically say, eh, the kid. The kid. That's what you need to learn here. Um, and why is that? Why was Jesus taking a child, stand beside and say, the one that's the least among you is the one who's great? I believe that actually it's because children understand how amazing they are, but not in a proud or arrogant way, just in a very naive, kind of honest way. So my nephew, he's seven years old. Um, I spent Easter with him and I turned to him and I said, you know, Alfie, you're incredible. Yes, I know I am, was the response. And actually not because he thinks I'm the bee's knees and I'm like the greatest gift to mankind on planet Earth, but he's just like, yeah, actually I know that I'm amazing and I know I'm incredible. Just in a really, and that is what I think Jesus was showing us here because kids are not proud or arrogant. They, they, just, they just accept the truth. And so you're all incredible. And, um, <laughs> and as, you, as he is, so are you in this world, meaning actually you've got a unique part to play in seeing God's kingdom, his rule and his reign established on um, planet Earth, wherever he's placed you. And so we're going to do a declaration together just to keep you awake. Um, and so if you'd like to read this with me, that would be fun. I am incredible. I am incredible. The Father has lavished his love on me, and I am called a child of God. As Jesus is, so am I in this world. I feel like we need to do that again with a bit of gusto. Wake, wake up. But I am incredible. The Father has lavished his love on me, and I am called a child of God. As Jesus is, so am I in this world. <laughs> and the thing is this, we have, I said this earlier, that we, like Ephesians 1, 4 says that he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. So before creation and conception, we were already in God's thoughts. Um, I had an encounter um, quite a few years ago, and um, before it happened, I was in a small group one night, and God spoke to me and said, Jan, I want to show you how I see you for all eternity. I was like, oh, okay then, nothing more. And then I think it was maybe like a few weeks later, I was um, out walking uh, where I work. There's a, I work like in this beautiful area, and there's like a river, and it's all trees and lovely. And I was out walking at lunchtime, and while, I've never had this happen since, but whilst walking in the sunshine with the birds tweeting and along by the river, I simultaneously have a heavenly encounter where I'm completely aware of heaven while still being aware of walking along by the river. So I have these two realm things simultaneously happening. Very mental, but really convinced me that I really am in two places. Um, and so I am... I'm, I find myself in the throne room and Father God um, gets up off of his throne, which was the first time I'd ever see that, seen that happen. He's usually just sitting on it. And he comes down and he goes off through towards a door to the right and says, Jan, come with me. So off I go and I go into this big room with this absolutely ginormous mirror, like, like, like maybe from the floor to, up to the kind of overhang canopy of that pulpit bit there, this giant mirror and huge thing and um, I was stood in front of it and um, basically I saw myself as I was at that point like how I looked on planet earth was what I saw in the mirror and then I saw me as like a wee baby in the mirror and then me as a wee toddler then I saw like me as a wee kid and then me when I was like pre-teen and then me in my teens and then I saw me in my 20s and then and then I saw me, like, I think I was probably in my early 30s at that point, and then I saw me as I was now, and then I saw me in, like, late 30s and in my 40s and my 50s and my 60s, and then I saw myself in my 70s and then my 80s and my 90s. And then what happened was all of the Jans spanned so that baby Jan to old Jan spanned out, and I saw all the Jans, and then it came back in, came back into the Jan that was 
on planet Earth at that moment. And then it spanned again, and I saw all the Jans, and then it came back to just Jan now, and then it spanned again, and back, and out, and back. And the whole time, Father God um, was, he remained in the, in the mirror, um, and he was the constant. Because the thing is this, he has always been with me, and will always be with me, and I'm made in his image, and I reflect him. But what he said to me, um, or what, what really I kind of got from that afterwards, first of all, was in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, which says, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. And so what I realized is that because God is beyond time, that I have been fully known forever. And before I was even aware of my own existence, I existed and he knew me. Um, and actually, remember Father God said he wanted to show me, me how he saw me for all eternity. And what he revealed and said to me afterwards that actually he sees me for all eternity in a winner. Now, I realize that in a winner is a Scottish term because I work with people from England now. And so all at once, all at once, he sees me all at once, for all eternity, in a winner. And so what that means is, like, I used to get really frustrated, like, all these prophetic words over my life, and, like, I'm not that person yet, and how do I get from here to there? And then I realized, actually, I am that person. I just haven't experienced me as that person yet. And that is the thing, is that we just need to line ourselves up with who God says that we are, not who we're not yet. Um, which is true of each and every one of us, which actually makes it a lot easier to honor people who um, offend you or who bug you or really you just do not click with. Um, because actually their behavior is not who they are, it's what they are doing. Um, so it doesn't actually define them, meaning that we can actually look at the gold inside of them, not react to what we see on the outside and really remember God sees you for all eternity and a winner. So the fact that I'm seeing you now, you're not going to stay like this. You're going to be someone different in 10 years' time. And actually, it really just helps to be like, ah, wow, you actually are incredible. You just haven't experienced you as how incredible you are yet, and nor have I. <laughs> um, and so I just another question. I just want you to think um, about someone or, or people that you find difficult. Um, how has a reminder of who you are and how God sees you affected how you might view that person or those people going forward? And I'll post these on our family Facebook page as well. And another question is, am I feeding myself with things that contribute to who I really am or letting myself get distracted? And if not, if you're not feeding yourself things that can jump to you, ask Holy Spirit, what would he recommend for you? Okay, so why does identity sit within honor? Um, so knowing who I am and who God says I am is absolutely crucial and fundamental to all relationships. My relationship with God, my relationship with other believers, my relationship with everyone, how I feel about myself, because it's actually... Um, knowing who I am really is an incredible foundational basis for a culture of honor. Romans 12, 10 says, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. So honor, simply put, being Jesus to people and seeing Jesus in people. Just really the practice of calling out the best in one another. And Romans 12, 16 says, live happily together in a spirit of harmony and be as mindful as one another's worth as you are of your own. So actually knowing our true identity in Christ, it gives us this like standpoint from which we can truly love. Because if we have to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, which is what Jesus asked us to do, actually when you know who you really are, you can love yourself, which makes it really easy to love people. But it's difficult when you don't have a clue who you are, actually how well can you love is, is really challenging. Um, and actually the lens perspective that you view other people through when you know who you are and is actually in God's image, the way he made them to be, that they are this absolutely phenomenal, incredible, amazing person and equally as amazing as you are. Um, <laughs> and 1 Corinthians 13, 7 says, love bears up under anything and everything that comes and is ever ready to believe the best of every person. That's what loving your neighbor as you love yourself looks like actually. 
ever ready to believe the best of every person. So honor is actually humility in action. True humility isn't thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. It's actually embracing who you are in light of God's high opinion of you. And it's rooted in thankfulness. It doesn't actually glorify God when we belittle um, his creation, whether that's ourselves or other people. Humility looks like knowing I am amazing and then giving him the thanks for it. And the more revelation that we have of who we are, actually, the, the, I find that just the more I'm able to be in awe and wonder and gratitude um, to him. And also, I think, just that ability to really love people and engage with them where they are, where they are in their life. So, like, I do stuff with the homeless on the street a lot, and I just love them because they're incredible, and they can't see it, but it's having eyes and a lens that just will honor people because they are created in his image and loved by him. And honor is about valuing people who are designed in God's image. And actually, when we don't value them, we're really disagreeing um, with God who valued them enough to die for them. And we need to learn to treat people as if we see God standing, like, within them. Um, and actually, our, the way that we, like, our love for God is demonstrated by the way that we love and treat other people. Because remember that um, when Saul was persecuting the Christians, Jesus was like, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And so actually, how we are loving and treating others actually impacts um, God himself. Um, and honor is about celebrating who someone is. It is not about who they're not. Which is why that thing of Jesus sees us for all eternity in a honor is so helpful. And because the thing that can happen often is we confuse honor with, um, we confuse approval with honor. I don't actually have to approve of you to honor you, and you don't have to approve of me to honor me. And that's exactly what Jesus did with Zacchaeus, if you remember the story. He did you know, Jesus honored the man who was the least honorable in the world. Actually, he was not highly thought of by anyone in that time or community. Um, but did Jesus approve of Zacchaeus' behavior? Um, I would say no. Um, but Jesus showed value for him and actually the, and loved him and honored him, and that brought him to repentance. He didn't, Jesus didn't talk to him about his sin. He just loved him and displayed the love of fa the Father and what Father was like. Heidi Baker says that, um, that they have more people saved because of honor than even blind eyes or deaf ears. Um, she told a story of honoring a chief of a village, um, but they served um, him coffee, and um, the man wept because he was told that coffee um, was only for the white man. And they then get access to preach the gospel to an entire village and watch them all get born again. And so there's just something about honor that we, we just need to um, grasp. And so I want to do something I've not done before, just as we close. Um, I'm going to give you some homework. Uh, so I just thought it would be fun to put this into practice a little bit, just in terms of getting to grips a little bit about with who you are. So the first one um, is, I want you, so refusing to speak negatively about yourself, because often the words that we speak um, line up more with what the enemy says than what Father God says about us. So I want you to pay attention to what comes out of your mouth and refuse to speak negatively about yourself or others. So your homework is to conscious, consciously use your words to reinforce the truth of who God says you are. And I want you to say three positive things about who you are or what you love about yourself every day this week. Number one. And then the second one is avoid comparison, because so often we spend a lot of our time, we waste time trying to compare ourselves to other people, want to be more like someone else, and actually it hinders us from being all that God wants us to be. So the antidote to comparison is thankfulness. So I want you to thank God as often as you need to this week for the way that he's made you and what he's called you to do. And um, we can also often struggle to receive encouragement um, and actually when we, we obviously need a work of the Holy Spirit in our lives to actually grasp the truth of fully who we are and how that impact our hearts, but we can practice and having our hearts opened up to receive like truth of who God says we are by um, having people encourage us. So it just trains us to receive. So that's what we're going to do. And um, 
just in general, like this is something Kezia taught me, when someone encourages you or tells you something that they love about you, add to the end, thank you, is there anything else you would like to add? So uh, that's just a really helpful thing because often they're like, yes, I would like to add something else and out comes some more. So your homework for this, receive encouragement. This week, ask a Christian friend to tell you what five things they specifically love about you. And then um, being authentic. Um, So being authentic really is about walking in truth and truth means nothing hidden. Um, No mass, letting people see you or who you are. um, And it's not always fun to tell people about, I find this difficult, I'm struggling with this, or whatever. Um, but it's vital, because otherwise the enemy wants to keep us silenced, alone, um, bound by shame, or by our past. Um, 1 John 1, 7 says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So having fellowship with one another, walking in the light, super important. However, accountability is not the account of disability, it's the account of ability. So actually, I need someone who will remind me who I am, call out the gold in me, cheer me on, pray for me, be a person of faith who's a believing believer so that when there's challenges, they can just stir me up and remind me of all the great things God said about me. So this week, uh, or this homework is, who do you have in your life who knows everything about you and is cheering you on? Thank them with this week and let them know how much you appreciate them. And if you don't have someone, ask God to show you who that might be, then courageously arrange coffee and take steps towards building an authentic relationship.